This is Laura Haley, and I'm going to tell you the story, Adventure on Griffin Island, written by me. Chapter 1. Griffin Band. I've packed nearly my whole wardrobe, said Layla excitedly. Layla was a clever, mischievous 13-year-old who loved gymnastics and practiced endlessly. She had black hair and brown eyes. Her 15-year-old brother, Callum, was a tall, sensible boy with blonde, curly hair and a face full of freckles. The pair were ecstatic that for their Easter holidays, they were going to visit their granddad Mike, who lived on a very remote island. The children and granddad Mike crammed into the taxi, waving goodbye to their parents and headed for the harbour. The passenger ferry took just under an hour to make the crossing from Cork Harbour to Griffin Island. Homeward bound, bellowed Grandad Mike in his fine Cork accent. Wow, Grandad, it's beautiful, exclaimed Callum, as they disembarked from the ferry. The sea was sparkling in the late afternoon sun, and Cork mainland was just about visible in the distance. This was a rare treat for the children to spend time on Griffin Island, as usually Grandad made the trip to Cork. The cottage is a bit of a trek, kids, so let's get on with it, explained Grandad Mike. They hiked over the hills, down country lanes, always with the coast in sight. On their route, they noticed a deserted white lighthouse above some ragged rocks. Do you really own that lighthouse? asked Layla, remembering some of Grandad's bedtime stories. I sure do, said Grandad Mike. Myself and Jim used to work it. Callum and Layla remembered Grandad's good friend, Jim, from when they visited the cottage years ago. He was a farmer and was one of the few residents on Griffin Island. Dinner was mashed potato and gravy, and then the exhausted two hit the hay. Just as they were dozing off, their Grandad Mike popped his head into their small, cosy room. Kids, I've got something to tell you, declared Grandad. He explained to the children that he had an urgent job to do on the mainland and they would have to go along with him. They were disappointed at the thought of missing time on the island and so pleaded with him to stay. We promise to behave, Grandad, cried Layla. We'll clean out the cottage for you. Come on, Grandad, I'm 15. We can mind ourselves, pleaded Callum. I suppose, sighed Grandad, it's not like there's any crooks anywhere around here. Grandad gave the children a set of rules to follow in his absence. No swimming, don't go near the machinery, be in by seven each night, and no adventuring while I'm gone, declared Grandad. Chapter Two, A Little Discovery. The next morning at the table, Grandad Mike finished up his breakfast, picked up his bags and wished the kids luck. He told the children that Jim would be looking in on them and he'd be back in two days. Then he disappeared over the hills. I was thinking last night, said Layla with a determined grin. What if we take a look at the lighthouse? I'm sure I saw the keys for it by the front door. No, Layla. Granda told us not to go adventuring without him, responded Callum impatiently. Well, I'm going, insisted Layla. Callum gave a frustrated sigh giving in to Layla's demands as usual. He helped her prepare a picnic, deciding he couldn't let her go alone. Five minutes later, they headed out on a great adventure. It took Layla and Callum 40 minutes to reach the lighthouse. Callum's shoulder was aching with the weight of the picnic. They hopped over the jagged rocks one by one and then found the front door of the lighthouse. Callum shoved the key in and wiggled it about until he heard a click and then pushed open the red wooden door. The door opened into a circular, musty smelling room. There was a little unstable table in the far left with three chairs placed around it. The room was dark with only two little windows squeezing in some daylight. Under the window was a dirty green couch and a dusty chest of drawers filled with ropes, torches and matches. Callum took the matches, striking one, to light the paraffin lamp. It brightened the room a little. In the middle of the room, there were metal stairs leading to the next floor. 
This floor was divided into two rooms. One tiny room had a toilet and a little porcelain sink, and the other slightly larger room was empty except for a cabinet crammed with books about old ships and the ways of the sea. The next floor had only one little room with two rusty beds and dusty bedclothes. The last few stairs led up to the lamp room at the very top of the lighthouse. I wonder if it still works, asked Layla. No, I don't think so. Grand and Mike and Jim used to work the beacon years ago when they used paraffin fuel. But after another electric lighthouse was built on Hawk Island, they stopped using this one, said Callum knowingly. The two kids went back downstairs and outside again into the fresh air. The sunlight blinded Layla and Callum after being in the gloom of the lighthouse. I'm getting hungry. Do you want to have lunch? asked Callum. Layla agreed. I am in the mood for some sandwiches. They walked over to a flat patch of grass and started unpacking the picnic. There was a choice of egg, ham or chocolate spread sandwiches served with juicy oranges and apples and some chocolate bars for after. They washed it all down with lemonade and then cleared things up. They explored the lighthouse some more and ran on the rocks until they saw that dark, heavy rain clouds had gathered overhead. A drizzle of rain fell and the two bolted for the shelter of the lighthouse. They slammed the door shut just before lightning struck and buckets of rain poured from the sky. Half an hour later, the sky was darker still and the rain kept on falling. There is no chance I'm walking home in that, cried Layla. We could easily get lost and fall in the massive puddles. I think we should stay the night, Callum. Callum hesitated, but then agreed. Chapter three, a sleepover in the lighthouse. Callum and Layla took the lamp upstairs to the little bedrooms where they shook out the blankets and banged the mattress to try to clear some of the dust. Callum headed down to the bookshelves and picked out some books about maritime disasters. When he arrived back up to the bedroom, Layla was unpacking the last of the picnic. Starting schoolwork already, she slagged. Callum read and Layla fidgeted with her phone, desperately trying to get signal while they nibbled their cherry cake and crisps. Let's check out the lamp room, said Callum excitedly, still focusing on his book. This book actually shows how a lighthouse beacon works, and we might be able to see all the way to Cork from up there. Layla and Callum climbed up the stairs with the portable lamp. It was pitch black outside, and the two could just make out the lights across the water in Cork. Give me your phone, Layla. I forgot mine, and I want to take some photos of how cool Cork looks from here said Callum. Uh, it ran out of battery, replied Layla. Callum pulled a big old sheet off the enormous paraffin lamp. All the equipment in the lamp room fascinated Callum. He compared the pictures in his book with the working parts of the lamp and was amazed that all the parts were in working order. Exhausted after their adventures that day, the children went downstairs to the bedroom. Callum blew out the lamp and they settled into bed. This is so exciting, exclaimed Layla. I can't believe we get to have a sleepover in the lighthouse. Chapter four, Strangers in the Night. The waves continued to crash up against the lighthouse and rain clattered down. Layla lay awake, listening to her brother snoring. Suddenly, she stiffened, hearing a noise and a creak. Callum, Callum, someone's coming, she gasped urgently. Callum sat up in bed with a fright and listened anxiously. They heard the pounding of footsteps. Quickly, Boris, bring in the bags of cash before they soak through, bellowed a low voice. I'm trying, Hank, muttered Boris in frustration. The door closed and the three men sighed with relief. The kids listened intently to the robbers' scheming conversation. Right, Boris and Hank, listen up. Tomorrow we'll leave by boat and take the cash to Cork, said the older, gruff man. 
You're the boss, Geroid. Whatever you say, laughed Boris. We'll be loaded by tomorrow night, lads, bragged Hank. We're going to rob every blooming shop in Blackberry Village and leg it. Layla and Callum were shivering with fright. Layla, why didn't you lock the door, said Callum crossly. I forgot, whispered Layla on the brink of tears. It's okay, Layla, just be quiet and don't make a noise. All of a sudden, there was a screeching ring from Layla's cardigan pocket. It was her mobile phone blaring. What's that? They heard Geroid shout from downstairs. Then came the thuds of the trio clambering up the stairs at lightning speed. Hank appeared at the door first. What have we got here? He sneered, showing his lopsided teeth. What do we do with these pests? We don't know what they've heard, said Boris. Geroid ordered Boris and Hank to grab the kids and send them up to the lamp room. We'll lock them in there, and by the time they are found, our job will be done, said Geroid slyly. The burly men grabbed the petrified children and dragged them up the stairs. The children kicking and screaming for help. No one's gonna hear you, sniggered Geroid, as the other men threw them into the lamp room and slammed the door shut. Boris held the door closed while Hank went down and then dragged up the old book cabinet, jamming it up against the door. Chapter 5 SOS Layla pulled on the door handle with all her strength, but the door didn't budge. It's no use, said Callum. Layla gave up on the door and slumped down in tears. Layla, roared Callum. I thought you said your phone was dead. We're locked up in here because of you. But, but, but I wanted to save my battery to text Mum and Dad goodnight, said Layla, quivering. Callum sighed and understood. We need to get out of here, said Callum, jumping to his feet. He began to examine all the parts of the lamp, clearly an idea forming in his head. He saw a tank of paraffin and rushed over to see was there any fuel left inside. In my book, I read how to work a paraffin lamp, and if I can do it, we can send out an SOS signal, said Callum excitedly. But we don't know Morse code, Callum, responded Layla, dismissing the idea already. But look, said Callum, picking up the tattered book which he had mistakenly left in the lamp room earlier that evening. It explains how to do the important maritime signals, said Callum, flicking through the pages. Layla and Callum got to work, with Callum giving regular instructions and checking back to the book. Callum took the matches from his back pocket from when he had lit the portable lamp earlier. To their great delight, the light beamed out through the glass, the children stretched out the old sheet that had been covering the lamp. Callum called out the instructions. We'll wave the sheet over the lamp to block the beam, explained Callum. We have to block it three times quickly, then three longer blocks, then back to the three quick blocks. That's the SOS signal. Anybody on this island will be sure to know it. They repeated the SOS signal over and over again until their arms ached. Chapter 6. The Escape The paraffin lamp dimmed until it went out completely. The children slumped down onto the creaky floor, not sure at all if anyone had seen their signal. It was late now and the only sound in the lighthouse was from the men snoring on the ground floor. Come on, there must be another way of getting out of here. Layla jumped up, refusing to give up hope. The floorboard beneath her seesawed as she landed. Look, Layla, the floorboard is loose. Help me pull it up, said Callum, hopping to his feet. Together they heaved on the wide floorboard, pulling it loose. They peered down into the bedroom below. What did I say, said Layla proudly. They continued to pull at the boards until there was a gap big enough for Layla to squeeze through. Callum helped her get her legs through the gap, 
and then held her hands lowering her closer to the floor of the bedroom beneath. Letting go of those hands, Layla used her gymna gymnast scales to land with a gentle thud. She froze and listened, but the snoring continued from the ground floor. Relieved, she swiftly ran up to the lamp room door and pulled back the heavy bookcase that was wedged under the door handle. Callum came out looking delighted and hugged Layla, nearly squeezing her to death. Come on, let's go now, before they wake up, said Callum softly. They cautiously tipped down, down the stairs, trying not to disturb the robbers. When they got to the ground floor, they crept past the snoring men, who were dead to the world. One sprawled on the couch, another slumped up against the couch, and the other on a pile of blankets on the floor. There were empty green bottles of booze on the table, and the room smelled of beer and sweat. Callum opened the front door and they both slipped out into the fresh night air, relieved to be free from the stench of the room. Chapter 7 Jim to the Rescue The children scurried over the rocks, away from the lighthouse. Layla slowed down. Wait, Callum, I can hear something, or someone. They edged closer to the voice and recognised Jim, standing a few metres away, speaking agitatedly into his phone. When he saw the children, he muttered one last thing, hung up the phone and ran to them. He hugged them, saying, Thanks be to God you're safe. Your granddad was worried sick when I called him. How did you know where we were? asked Layla. Jim explained how he had checked in on the children earlier that evening. When he found they were gone, he had scoured the island looking for them. He was on a second loop of the island on his tractor when he caught sight of the beam from the lighthouse lamp illuminating the coast. He wondered what was going on, and then realised not only was the lighthouse lamp on, it was sending a distress signal. He jumped off his tractor and headed across the rocks towards the lighthouse. He peered through the window just his eyes and forehead peeking above the windowsill. He spotted the three burly men sitting at the table, counting a bundle of cash and drinking beer rowdily. Jim figured there, there no, there's no coincidence here. The children were missing, dangerous looking strangers in the lighthouse, and a distress signal from the lamp room. He knew the children must be in danger. Jim moved away from the lighthouse where he couldn't be seen, phoning the guardie and Grandin Mike. The guards will be here in five minutes tops, explained Jim. Let's move away from here and we'll head to the dock where the guards will be landing. But what if they escape while we are waiting, exclaimed Layla worriedly. Layla, have you still got the key, asked Callum. Layla produced the lighthouse key from her pocket. Callum took it, climbed over the rocks, and crept up to the door. He shoved the key in, turning it and locking it, making it impossible for the men to escape. With that, Jim and the children made their way to the dock, arriving just as the guardy boat landed. Three men and a woman in their guardy uniform stepped off the boat. You must be Jim. Jim and the children showed the guards to the lighthouse and handed over the key. Within a matter of seconds, the men emerged with dazed but furious robbers, hands cuffed behind their backs. How did you escape? roared Geroid upon spotting the children. The guardie congratulated Jim and the children. These criminals have been our main priority since they robbed the bank in Ballyduggan a few weeks back. They've been on the run, robbing every town in the area. The guardie escorted the sullen men back to the dock and onto the boat. <clears throat> As they left Griffin Island, Grandad Mike could be seen puffing and panting, approaching the dock in a rowboat. The sun was just rising as he disembarked, cheeks as red as cherries. He squeezed the children in his big arms, tears gushing from his eyes. Chapter 8 A Bit Less Activity the next morning, Grand and Mike was at the table when Layla and Callum came out from their rooms. I'm so sorry, Grandad, 
wailed Layla. It was all my fault. I made Callum come when I knew we shouldn't. I'm really sorry, added Callum. I'm disappointed in you both. I had warned you not to go adventuring without me. That lighthouse is not a place for children to be by themselves, granted Mike said sternly. But after all, you handled the situation very well and you don't know how proud I am. You've clearly learned from the best, he added with a giggle. Those robbers have committed a lot of crimes and without you, they would never have been caught. Now, Grandon Mike sighed, leaning back into his kitchen chair. Let's finish the holiday with a bit less activity. Layla and Callum smiled and laughed with their granddad. I think that's a good idea, agreed Callum. Boring, squealed Layla cheekily. They sat down with their granddad, settling in to a game of cards. The end. Thank you for listening to my story. Bye.